Welcome to the Campbell Museums. A mundane object, like a baby bottle, has many stories it can tell. In this video, I explore just a few of these stories. You can think of this video as the abridged history behind baby bottles. This video is part of our What's in the Box series, where I pull a box from storage and see what we find inside. Check out the box number five playlist for more. Thanks for watching and please consider supporting us by liking this video, subscribing to our channel, and becoming a member of the Campbell Museums. This 1950s baby bottle is fairly unassuming, but before baby bottles like this were invented, babies were dying in mass. You see, babies need milk to survive, which seems basic enough, but historically getting milk safely into babies' bellies has been full of challenges that often resulted in infant death. Today, when it comes to breastfeeding, you are often damned if you do and damned if you don't. There always seems to be someone with an opinion about why each decision is the wrong decision. You have to follow this feeding schedule. Formula's good, so just use that. It's easier. Boobs are sexy. Only flaunt them for men. Breast is best, and anything less means you don't love your baby. So how did we find ourselves in this predicament? Let's explore the complex history behind the breastfeeding, bottle feeding debate, heavily abridged, of course. Historically, the conversation around breastfeeding assumed that the breastfeeding parent was a cisgendered woman. Since the historical material and belief systems explored in this video exist within that framework, our video will use cisgendered terms. Finally, this video explores North American values surrounding bottles and breastfeeding. Since our species began, breastfeeding was the rule. If a newborn was not breastfed, she most likely died of malnutrition. If for some reason the mother could not provide breast milk herself, perhaps she died in labor, perhaps she could not produce milk, then a wet nurse was used. A wet nurse is a woman who breastfeeds a baby who is not her own. More on wet nurses later in the video. If a wet nurse could not be found, then breast milk alternatives were often provided using a vessel of some sort, like a pap boat or a bubby pot. One alternative was animal milk. Another formula was bread soaked in water or milk with sugar added. Sometimes the baby suckled directly from an animal's teeth. Unfortunately, attempts to keep a baby alive using alternatives to breast milk often had the opposite effect, leading to the baby's death. As in most of our videos, we can't escape our old friend, the Industrial Revolution. As odd as it sounds, industrialization had a huge effect on breast milk production, milk alternatives, be it animal or formulated, and a decrease in infant deaths. During the 1800s, many women began to work in factories. Similar to many workplaces today, employers did not provide breastfeeding accommodations to new mothers, and as a result, mothers were unable to breastfeed their babies on the child's natural feeding schedule. Instead, factories expected mothers to adhere to strict breastfeeding schedules, which in turn limited the number of feedings in a day. This concept of following strict feeding schedules lingers to this day and competes with the more modern advice to follow an intuitive feeding schedule. Why does this matter? Well, reducing feeding is problematic because the act of feeding a baby stimulates more milk production. So by limiting and scheduling feedings at work and in hospitals, mothers began to produce less milk. Doctors became concerned about what they called lactation failure, but at the time, no one connected the reduction in breast milk production to the profound changes in breastfeeding frequency that industrialization had brought about. As mothers found themselves unable to produce enough milk, they either hired a wet nurse, which is what most doctors recommended, or began to supplement with animal milk. Unfortunately, animal milk carried deadly consequences. Let's take a quick detour and remind ourselves about the overall state of medical knowledge around the Industrial Revolution. 
We begin the 1800s with a general understanding of human anatomy, but little was known of biochemistry, endocrinology, or germs. In this world, smallpox, cholera, measles, and other infectious diseases were believed to be caused by miasma, also called bad air, created by rotting organic material. Treatment of disease relied heavily on a change of air, inducing vomiting and bleeding to clear impurities from the body. Water and airborne infection were not accepted theories. By the mid-1800s, medical science began to advance. Anesthesia was developed in the late 1840s, helping to advance surgery. Unfortunately, without understanding germs, surgeries were not carried out with antiseptics or sterilization tools. It wasn't until 1854 when Dr. John Snow demonstrated that cholera infection was indeed spread by contaminated water, that people began to question miasma theory. A few years later, Louis Pasteur laid the foundations for germ theory. Unfortunately, germ theory took a few decades to catch on, but by the 1880s, it had replaced miasma theory. The acceptance of germ theory ushered in an emphasis on rigorous hygiene and the sterilization of tools. So, in an era where the concept of germs and bacteria was in its infancy, <laughs> doctors and mothers were unaware that the animal milk they were feeding babies in place of breast milk was rife with deadly bacteria and mold. Then, in 1862, Louis Pasteur, the man who brought us germ theory, provided a solution to deadly animal milk by inventing pasteurization, which kills the deadly bacteria in milk by carefully heating it. But as with germ theory, pasteurization was slow to catch on. For decades, doctors and concerned citizens campaigned to inform mothers who did not breastfeed of the importance of using pasteurized milk. These campaigns also stressed keeping milk cold and covered and to not let flies land on it. There were also services that provided wet nurses to people in need. It wasn't until 1908 that the first city in the U.S., Chicago, passed an ordinance that required all milk sold in the city to be pasteurized. And in 1947, Michigan became the first state to require pasteurization of milk. As the dairy industry became regulated in the 20th century, making pasteurized milk more easily available in urban areas, infant mortality for artificially fed babies began to fall. Now, you may be wondering why mothers relied less on wet nurses as we neared the 20th century, even when most doctors recommended nurses over animal milk. Even today, the idea of using a wet nurse in the United States is pretty out there. How did society turn against something humans have done for millennia? This leads to a complicated sidebar about how wet nurses were viewed in American society. Wet nurses were often hired when a mother died in childbirth, but insufficient milk production for whatever reason was also a reason to hire a wet nurse. Working women often faced pressure to abandon breastfeeding so they could work longer hours, and hiring a wet nurse was often less expensive than having to hire someone else to help run the family business or household. Mrs. Isabella Beaton, the Martha Stewart of the Victorian era, promoted breastfeeding in 1861, but when a wet nurse was needed, she warned the mistress of the house to keep a watchful eye on the wet nurse, since the wet nurse will eat unhealthy foods if left to her own devices. She also warns that wet nurses hide bottles of narcotics and deadly syrups to drug babies into slumber. By 1888, Mrs. Beaton updated her advice to no longer promote hiring a wet nurse, she writes, If, however, the mother be unable to nurse her child, it is better to bring it up upon cow's or goat's milk than to engage a hired nurse. Additionally, some women during the Victorian era were influenced by Queen Victoria and simply chose not to breastfeed, as Queen Victoria herself is said to have believed that breastfeeding was an unsuitable practice for aristocratic women. She considered it an animal function. The women who provided service as a wet nurse varied. Many were often mothers who suffered from losing their own child. 
prior to the Civil War, enslaved women were often forced into giving their milk to white infants. During the Victorian era, it was common for poor women to abandon their own children so they could work as a wet nurse for a wealthier family. These wet nurses were usually single women who'd been abandoned by their families or the father of their children. If they worked for a private family, it was unlikely they could bring along their own baby, so their baby would be relegated to a foundling home where the chance of survival was bleak. The decline in the use of wet nurses is multifaceted. Some mothers felt empathy for the sacrifices of the wet nurses themselves and the tragic fates of their babies. But another important factor in the decline of wet nursing seems to be quite the opposite. Instead of empathy for the wet nurses, many middle-class Victorian women began to feel disdain towards them, disgusted by how poor the wet nurses were. Lucky for them, the Industrial Revolution was working on a new alternative. Now, there was no need to let a wet nurse into one's home or risk the dangers of animal milk. What could it be? Baby formula. So let's back up a minute and explore the development of baby formula. During the Industrial Revolution, at the same moment that women were working more and the need for breast milk alternatives became dire, the commercial dairy industry was rapidly developing. In addition to more animal milk being produced, it also included canned evaporated and canned condensed milk. During the American Civil War, canned milk became widely adopted as a result of being given to the troops. We can't cover the topic in this video, but the ability to can food transformed society. Before refrigeration, the ability to preserve food long term was limited and canning was a boon to food preservation. Baby food was front and center in this transformation. Unsurprisingly, during the 1860s, we began to see proprietary infant food companies market canned animal milk as an alternative to breast milk. This is the predecessor of baby formula. Around the same time, attempts were being made to enhance animal milk by adding ingredients to make it as nutritious as breast milk. As early as 1865, Hustus von Liebig developed, patented, and marketed an infant food consisting of cow's milk, wheat, malted barley flour, and potassium bicarbonate, giving us the first infant formula. By 1883, there were 27 patented brands of infant food. All of these foods were fattening, but lacked valuable nutrients like protein, vitamins, and minerals. As with canned milk, it was mainly proprietary companies that developed baby formulas rather than physicians. By 1929, the American Medical Association formed the Committee on Foods to approve the safety and quality of formula composition forcing many infant food companies to seek their approval. As a result, by the 1940s, a strong relationship developed between physicians and the formula companies. As a result, formula was often doctor recommended to new mothers in lieu of breastfeeding and even being fed to newborns while still in the hospital. Now, on to our baby bottle that inspired this video. As more and more babies were shifted to animal milk and formula diets, more attention was paid to the vessel used to administer milk to babies. Enter the modern baby bottle in 1851. It was made of glass and it contained a cork nipple and ivory pins and air inlets to regulate flow. Bottles offered mothers an alternative to the exhaustion of breastfeeding, especially after a long day at work or when wearing a corset. Dad could even help the baby practically fed itself. However, with this modern convenience came untold tragedy since, as with milk, bacteria and mold flourished in the difficult to clean hoses, leather or rubber nipples, and bottle crevices. As noted earlier, germ theory was not widely adopted until the 1880s, so no one understood the need to properly sterilize the bottles. In fact, in 1861, our friend Mrs. Isabella Beaton advised, when once properly adjusted, the nipple need never be removed till replaced by a new one, which will hardly be necessary oftener than once a fortnight. The nursing bottle should be thoroughly washed and cleaned every day, warm water being squeezed through the nipple to wash out any particles of food that might lodge in the aperture and become sour. 
Fortunately, once the dangers of bacteria became apparent, improvements to bottle designs to make them easier to sterilize were quick to arrive. By 1888, Mrs. Isabella Beaton had changed her tune. It is most essential to the success of this method of feeding that the bottle or bottles be kept scrupulously clean. She also noted that bottles, tubes, and nipples need to be scalded in hot water after use and then soaked in water with disinfectant, like Condi's fluid, until its next use. Our bottle is a result of much trial and error in this quest to make a safer bottle. Our bottle dates to around the 1950s and was made by Rexall. The glass and nipple are easy to disinfect. As we have explored, between 1850 to 1950, there were many factors behind the push for artificial feeding over breastfeeding. But there are more reasons, which we will briefly review, as they could be entire videos on their own. Artificial feeding allowed doctors more control over women's bodies and parenting decisions. The belief that breast milk was practically useless led to unnecessary practices like forcing breast milk to dry up using injections instead of letting the milk dry up naturally if a gestational parent decided not to breastfeed. By the 1950s, the practice of separating parents and children after birth further promoted strict feeding schedules and the use of formula. It was even recommended that solid foods be fed as soon as possible. Employers continued to benefit from artificial feeding because it allowed them to demand that new mothers come back to work as soon as possible. And I would be remiss if I didn't also mention the effect that the sexualization of the breast by Western culture has had on breastfeeding. This duality, do breasts exist to nurture your child, or do breasts exist to arouse sexual partners, confronts breastfeeding women with the Madonna whore dichotomy and causes many to feel shame or to be shamed when breastfeeding in public. Formula feeding helps women avoid this dilemma. The switch away from formula and back to breastfeeding started around the 1950s when pregnant people began to push back against this pro-formula rhetoric and the medical community's love affair with formula and solid foods. Groups like La Leche League and the Boston Women's Health Book Collective, who published Our Bodies Ourselves, encouraged pregnant parents to take control of their health decisions, including breastfeeding. In 1997, the American Academy of Pediatrics set the standard to breastfeed exclusively for the first six months. They also noted that cow's milk was not recommended until the infant was 12 months old. As society shifted back towards breastfeeding, a PSA campaign was launched by the US government and the Ad Council, the creators behind many of our most memorable PSAs, with the tagline, babies were born to be breastfed. Unfortunately, a tagline like that implies that any parent who would choose formula over the breast was neglecting their child's safety. It was relatively effective marketing, Breastfeeding rates across all racial groups have increased since the 1960s, though the 21st century has once again seen a slight decline in breastfeeding. That said, black gestational parents have not seen as great of an increase as white or Hispanic gestational parents. Some argue that the aversion to breastfeeding among the black community is rooted in slavery and being forced to act as wet nurses. Research shows that black newborns are more likely to be given formula in hospitals than white babies, showing a structural force within the medical community that encourages black families to use formula. And while health officials encourage exclusive breast milk for the first six months, only 25% of new parents adhere to the recommendation. Obviously, the use of formula is not a sign that you don't want what's best for your child. So what's going on? Today, the majority of gestational parents who want to exclusively breastfeed for the first six months are faced with the same systemic issues that parents in the 1800s were faced with. The inability to balance work and childcare due to a lack of workers' rights and protections, including maternity leave and having private clean rooms in the workplace for pumping milk. It is a privilege to choose to breastfeed in modern-day America because social supports are not in place. All said and done, 
The benefits of breast milk over formula are still being studied and debated. But even if breast milk has advantages, the invention and improvement of baby formula and baby bottles over the last 170 years or so has saved countless infant lives and allowed parents to continue participating in the workforce after giving birth. Now, when you're confronted with the many opinions on breastfeeding versus formula feeding, I hope our baby bottle exploration provided you with some context for how those beliefs were formed. Mundane objects can contain big stories, and this baby bottle had a lot to say. What other stories might it tell? <laughs>